Hello, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina, and my guest today is Andy Ross from Shetland Tweet Company. Welcome, Andy. Thank you, Irina. It's lovely to meet you virtually, and it's lovely, obviously, to meet your audience virtually too. Someday, I hope we'll get to meet in person. Oh, that's my dream, like to come to Shetland one day and meet everybody I've interviewed from Shetland in person. <laughs> lovely. I'm sure we would be absolutely delighted to host you. Thank you. So let's start with that. Let's start with how you came to Shetland, because you're not from Shetland originally, right? No, I'm not. Um, it's quite a long story, so I'll try and cut it short. I grew up in Zimbabwe uh, during the war, so um, during the 1970s into the 80s. And throughout my childhood, um, we were surrounded by music, first of all, and people playing instruments as they walked along the road and singing and all of that kind of uh, musical innateness, I guess you'd call it. But I was also surrounded by textiles. Uh, Zimbabwe, especially the town that I grew up in, um, was known for cotton production. So we used to make very high quality cotton for export, mainly to the UK. But for some very big companies, um, David Whitehead amongst them, uh, you would recognize some of the patterns um, if, uh, if you did some research on Zimbabwean cotton. And most of those productions were either for, as I said, export to Britain or, or local production. And the way that the British industry worked was they would have designers actually making patterns for cloth. And then the, the cloths would be produced in Buloyo in Zimbabwe, where I grew up. So I quickly got used to um, not just African print, the, the prints that people know as African, but also amazing textiles from the UK, from Europe, okay. um, working with big designers like John Piper and people like that. Then I was very lucky to be an exchange student and I went to Chicago uh, on a, a year's exchange with Rotary and it was while I was there that I did a lot of music and I won a scholarship, a music scholarship to go back to um, Chicago and, and learn to be a classical singer. But I had to go back to Zimbabwe and complete my education so I did that and I trained in hotel and catering management in Bulawayo where I grew up and then I started my journey to go back to Chicago I told you this was a very long story. Oh, we're not in a rush. I'm, I'm like, I'm loving every second of it. So, so I, at that point, um, the routes to America were through London. Um, everything was through London. If, if you came from the subcontinent, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So I flew to London and I was preparing to go to America but I happened to go to a gay pride march in London mm -hmm. and I met my now husband at the gay pride march. And so I never left London, but I still wanted to do music. So I went to college, dropped out a few times from college because I was paying overseas student fees. And eventually I managed to get not only my British nationality, my British passport, but I also managed to, to get into college uh, and, and finish college. So that was my first sort of love was, um, uh, my first sort of training was hotel and catering management. My first love was music and continues to be music. I set up a charity called Global Yale up in Shetland because at the time that I was actually doing that, um, I didn't have any passport. I didn't have a Zimbabwean passport and I didn't have British nationality, so I couldn't travel. If I'd gone out of the country, then I wouldn't have been allowed back in. And by that stage, I was with Andrew. So I bought a house up in Shetland, which is, um, sadly, I'm currently selling, but has been my home for 20 years. And I set up Globally Elders Charity to teach music. And I moved up to Shetland in 2001 at that point, it was the only part of the UK that I could afford to buy any property at all. It was very cheap, the, the house that I bought, and in a beautiful location. So I had plenty of space and time to do what I wanted to do in a beautiful place. I then set up a charity, uh, sorry, a um, cafe, a, a small restaurant on the island, um, and that acted as a community cafe. So lots of arts events, lots of craft went on. We did evening meals. We also were open to visitors. We had um, art 
uh, art exhibitions and classes. And one of those things that we did was we worked with the Anne Sutton Foundation, which was a foundation in England okay. um, to look at textiles. And that particular project came about because of a, a different project that we had done with the London School of Economics to create a business innovation space. So looking at how business could be inspired by art and craft. Mm -hmm. As part of that business innovation space, we commissioned artworks and one of them was commissioned from the Anne Sutton Foundation. And we asked Anne Sutton Foundation if they could weave a whirlpool for us. The reason we chose a whirlpool was because the whole theme was around chaos theory. You know, if a butterfly flaps its wings here, you get a storm up here kind of thing. And we were using Edgar Allan Poe's short story, Descent into a Maelstrom, to actually act as the, the catalyst for all these inspiring artworks. And the Anne Sutton Foundation wove us a beautiful whirlpool, a sculpture which stands a couple of foot high, about six foot wide, three different spirals coming out from a central point and circulating outwards, all in blues, greens, creams, the, the colors of the sea and the land. And it's a freestanding structure made in a, a technique called double cloth. Um, so weaving at one point, four different layers of cloth, all at the same time like that. And the interlacing of the the sections is what's actually stitching this whirlpool together. So it was woven that way, interlaced, and then turned on its edge and opened up. And it looks sort of like the inside of one of those cardboard boxes that you put wine bottles or bottles into. Right. Very complicated structure based on Fibonacci sequence. Um, so that's the, the ratio that describes spirals. And a beautiful thing, which has been on exhibition a few times um, across the UK uh, uh, and in Ireland. And that was my introduction to weaving. So I started to, we started to look at weaving and how we could support the textile industry in Shetland. And just after we had um, created, along with the Anne Sutton Foundation, a three-year plan to actually support uh, weaving in Shetland, the foundation announced that they were closing, which meant we couldn't do our project. So we asked if we could have the equipment. At that time, if you remember, I had a music charity right. and the Anne Sutton Foundation very kindly said, yes, if you change the aims of your charity, we'll donate the equipment to you because in the UK, you can't sell the assets of a charity. It has to be gifted to another organization with similar aims. Mm -hmm. So that was how we ended up with weaving equipment in Shetland, but didn't have a clue how to use it. I'd <laughs> never woven in my life before. <laughs> But we did a, a course a couple of weekends and it was on the third or fourth day of this four day course that I suddenly understood the mechanics of weaving are very similar to music in that you have a limited number of um, processes and you have a limited number of uh, raw materials, so threads in the case of weaving. And it's how you put those things together that makes something really interesting. So for music, for example, you've got eight notes right. in the Western scale and you put it together in different ways and you end up with hundreds of thousands of millions of songs just because of the ways that you put them together. And I began to get very interested in, in weaving uh, and have continued to be interested ever since. So that's how I came to be up in Shetland. Right. Well, let me ask you another very broad question. What is tweed? Oh, that, that's <laughs> a very broad question. <laughs> so tweed is a Scottish cloth. It's not only Scottish now, it's, it's around the globe, basically. Um, it's made in England and Ireland. Um, it's made in Scotland, across Scotland, and it's made in other places. But the first tweed, the first uh, name tweed, comes from about the 1830s. And there are a couple of different stories around how the name came about. Um, but the most likely is that someone saw either a misspelling or misread the word tweed, which actually comes from the word tweeled, T-W-E-L-E-D. -E -E 
And that's an old Scottish word meaning to have a twill in it. And a twill is a diagonal line in the cloth. So um, I'm wearing a two, two twill at the moment. So two threads up, two threads down, two threads up, two threads down. And then you advance one in the next set of threads. So you end up with this diagonal line in the cloth. And someone probably either misread or it was misspelt tweed and they thought aha this is a really useful marketing concept in 1830 <laughs> and so the name was probably an accident but a happy accident so the first tweeds were made in scotland and they were made on a system a, a system that uses woolen spinning for the threads i don't know if you and your listeners will know about spinning but there are two different types of spinning that we do there's woolen and worsted. Worsted is where you take the, the fibers off the sheep or whatever animal you're using, and the fibers are all jumbled up together. And you then card and comb them so that the fibers lie like that. And then you twist them around each other to get your thread. In woolen spinning, you don't um, comb the fibers, you just card them. So some of the fibers are still twisted around and still slightly bent. And that means that they, they trap more air when you actually make them into the threads because they're slightly bent over. So you end up with a, a slightly less strong uh, thread, but something that's light and airy traps air and is, is really warm. So tweed is, if it's to be true Scottish tweed, it's made on the woolen or what was called the Scotch system. It's made out of sheep's wool. It, it shouldn't be made out of anything else if it's proper tweed. There are various um, colors that people say go with tweed. Uh, the most common is a, a mottled effect. So the, the yarns are a mixture of colors and mixtures is definitely a, a tweedy thing. So a mixture is when you take lots of different colors and mix them up together before you actually make the threads. And you end up with a fiber that has dots of color through it or different variations of color. And you also end up with quite a lot of color in the actual cloth when you finish it. They tend to be made out of cheviot if they're Scottish, but the difference between ordinary tweed, Scottish tweed and Shetland tweed is that Shetland tweed is made from, or should be made from the wool of Shetland sheep. Right. And that's another whole story. But basically I think those are probably the only things I can think of um, to tell you broadly about what makes tweed tweed. But then Shetland tweed, you are like right now you are the only person or you're the only company that manufactures real Shetland tweed right yes in in Shetland right um and what's the characteristic of that tweed versus like the Scottish one is it much softer because the Shetland sheep is so much softer yeah so there's there's a couple of problems with um the designation Shetland tweed and I've just finished a master's degree uh, looking at Shetland tweed with Glasgow School of Art and it was a research degree looking at the history heritage and future for Shetland tweed. Um, it is softer, it drapes well, it's not as um, hard as Scottish tweed so it can't be used for things like formal jackets, it doesn't suit. It tends to bag which means that it tends to lose its shape Quite because of the, the elasticity in, in the yarn. Um, in the heyday of Shetland tweed, it was known for its coloration, its, its natural color. So there was a lot made of the natural colors of the sheep. And then of course, artificial dyes came in and tastes changed in the 1950s. So obviously that we've lost a little bit of that. The problem is that Shetland tweed is made all over the world. And it doesn't necessarily need to be made out of even wool nowadays because Shetland has a particular kind of feeling. So I have seen a cloth that's a jacket made from a cloth that's produced in China that is actually made of polyester simply because it feels like Shetland wool. And of course, polyester is a plastic. It's not, it's not a natural fiber. The other problem is that Shetland sheep went all over the UK and to American places like that. So anyone legitimately producing tweed from Shetland breed sheep can call it Shetland tweed. Anyone producing tweed on the islands of Shetland from any wool at all can call it Shetland tweed because it's produced on the islands. Right. And anyone producing um, tweed uh, on Shetland from Shetland sheep wool can also call it Shetland tweed. So 
it's quite a muddy story around Shetland Tweed. It's but so you're funny right, because it's like we have the, I have like similar discussion about Shetland lace because there was this whole, you know, like we have, there is a group on Facebook called Find Shetland Lace and there is knitters from all over the world there and some of them produce the most gorgeous lace and a lot of people use Shetland wool for, to, to produce that lace, but some people use different um, fibers like cashmere and silk and linen and like everything in between. Um, and there was this whole discussion about like, can you still call it Shetland lace? Because if you're not on Shetland and you're not knitting the Shetland wool, can it still be called Shetland lace just because you're using the motifs that's, you know, usually thought of as Shetland lace motifs, you know? So it's, it's interesting mm. that it's the same. It's like similar story, basically, of what you can it call is it. Yes, absolutely. Shetland lost its name a long time ago. So it's not like Shetland Tweed is not like Harris Tweed. Harris Tweed is the only tweed in the world, the only fabric in the world that's protected by law. There's legislation around Harris Tweed and it has an authority to look after its interests. Shetland's never been able to go down that route. There have been a couple of attempts to try and protect Shetland Tweed as a designation for Shetland. But in the UK, those court case has always been thrown out because the argument is that it's a geographical designation rather than anything else. That of course brings to mind why is Harris Tweed able to be protected when Harris is actually the name of an island as well. Right. But I think there is a lack of understanding around the importance of the name Shetland to the textile industries of the islands. And it's that lack of knowledge, maybe, or lack of impetus that causes uh, the general public to be unaware of the importance of that name to Shetland. Well, so. you have this program that I know you've mentioned somewhere in one of your interviews, where you bring basically like an apprentice for a few months and you teach them um, weaving of Shetland tweed. Is that still the program that you run? We're about to start it again, yes. So during COVID, um, I'm actually speaking to you from London. Um, my husband lives in London, so I'm in central London speaking to you. Going back to Shetland tomorrow, which is going to be lovely, three weeks up in the islands. Um, during COVID, the studios closed, as did everything else. And production from my Shetland Tweed company actually stopped until July last year, July 2020, after lockdown ended. During that time, we looked very closely at what the charity was doing and how we could support and how we could continue to operate, but be a benefit to the community. Driven mainly not by the closure of the studio, but by the fact that uh, my husband and I, Andrew is also called Andrew, so there's two of us. Um, we are moving to New Zealand, we're emigrating. So we wanted to continue the work that I'd started and have been doing for 20 years up in the islands, but make it much more relevant to Shetland. So we've been looking at ways for me to continue to work with the charity, but also to open it up more broadly. And one of those ways to do that is by reinstating the program that you're talking about, okay. bringing people in, basing the residencies on Shetland wool and Shetland tweed, but allowing people to explore and use the tradition in their own kind of way. Um, we've just started a project with uh, Borneo um, in Malaysia, obviously. And the silk weavers, the ECAP weavers, I had a conversation with them and they said, well, send us some wool. So I sent a, a cone of wool across to, to Malaysia. And they have started weaving on a silk warp with a silk and wool weft. Mm -hmm. But they're using traditional motifs from their part of the world, inspired by tweed. So it's a really interesting way to take forward a tradition that has largely died. As you said, I'm the last of the traditional weavers of tweed, and I don't even make traditional, I don't make tweed like this. Our production is, is colorful and contemporary. And I have another weaver designer working with me who I trained up and who's now running the company. So there's only really one person making Shetland tweed at the moment in Shetland. Right. Um, do you feel like 
it's like a natural progression, natural evolution of tweed, and this is where it should go? Or do you feel like it's very important to preserve the traditional look of Shetland tweed or tweed in general? Like where, are you? because you're an artist and I've seen your like weaving and it's just like unbelievable. Like some of the things, some of the fabrics you create, uh, it's just like all, you know, mind blowing. But they don't look like the traditional tweed weaving to me. Mm. I mean, I'm not mm. an expert, but where do you stand? Like, do, are you like torn in between? That's a really interesting question and one that we've been having a lot of discussion about. It took me a long time to understand that by preserving something in the way that it has always been made actually leads to stagnation of an industry. There is only so much houndstooth that you can make in a certain colorway, in a certain way that the world wants to buy. And you're then kind of beholden or you're restrained and constrained by tastes and fashion. So I'm a firm believer in producing beautiful fabrics that have their heritage in Shetland tweed. So we use the very simple patterns that Shetland tweed has always used. So twills, diamonds, and um, all of that kind of stuff, and plain weave. But experimenting at the same time, trying out new things to see what actually works and what doesn't work. And I think what's really interesting is that people coming into the studio will walk into the first part of the studio, which is our education part. And then they'll walk through into the production end where we actually make the long lengths of cloth that we do. And they will look at the cloth that's on the loom, which as you say, is very colorful. And because they're actually there looking at it and they have the smell of the wool and they have the, the, the visual impact of, of wool on a loom, which you don't really get on the internet they will always say that is Shetland, that speaks to Shetland, that is Tweed. So I think it's a very fine line between creating something that is not of its time and place um, and that is not rooted in its heritage and something that is rooted in its heritage and is of its time and place and contemporary and exciting. I think that's a very fine line. Sometimes yeah. we miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I also saw some of the examples that your students made and you can definitely see that like their heritage is part of what they make like there was an example of like one of your i think it was hungarian student and it was like this bright red and yellow colors that you probably wouldn't see normally in shetland like do you support that kind of exploration of the artists that come into your studio to bring their own heritage into weaving Yes. Yes, because at one point Shetland Tweed was new. Shetland Tweed itself, the designation Shetland Tweed, we can trace back, I can't remember the exact date, but it's to the 1840s. So it's, it's at least a decade after Tweed started in Scotland. And it was a development of the fabrics that were already being made and had been made in Shetland for millennia by that stage. If it hadn't been for tweed coming along, then the new colors wouldn't have come along into, uh, into weaving. If the new colors hadn't come along into weaving, then we wouldn't have the amazing variety that is stored in the archive upon which I've built my work in the 1960s and 70s. Right. So I do support it. I think I draw the line really um, at putting into production any of those kinds of fabrics or any of those kinds of ideas because they're not of Shetland, but they're very valuable for other things. So for example, the one you're talking about was actually bought by the fashion company Chanel um, for their collection, because it was so different. It used Shetland wool, so it was soft and drapeable and supple. It was bright colors and small motifs, which they liked at that point. And the, the juxtaposition of the colors was really interesting for them but it wasn't a Shetland cloth. It had right. just been made there, but it had another use anyway. Do you ever like get surprised or blown away by the, what your students bring to the studio? The yes, constantly. Their way of thinking. Like... 
constantly. So I, I spoke about Alexa, who's the weaver that we have at the moment. Um, Alexa learned, I gave her a couple of lessons, but nothing very much. And I realized one day when I had corrected, I thought, what she had done, that actually I was teaching her to make my cloth and not her own cloth. So I, I stopped teaching her at that point and she's taught herself. And she constantly amazes me with the way that she puts colors together and textures and understands how to actually operate quite a complex piece of machinery to get the effects she wants. Other students have done things based on their studies. So maybe things from the Bauhaus movement, um, geometric pieces made out of wool and silk covered copper wire, or someone was weaving with natural fibers, someone else was weaving with recycled ropes. None of these things are commercially viable without more um, exploration and without more experimentation. But in terms of giving a student coming out of university an experience of actually working in a, a working factory and also having a play and seeing what happens is really valuable. So constant surprises, yes. Let's talk a little bit about your feeling as an outlander living in Shetland, because to me, like when I first heard of Shetland and when I first imagined Shetland, I had this vision that like everybody was like born, raised there, their great grandmothers needed, their great grand uncles fished and they all like still live the same lifestyle. But then the more I'm talking to Shetlanders, the more I feel like there is all these people coming from other parts of the world and it's very metropolitan basically uh, feel to that and mm -hmm. influenced by many cultures. How were, how did you find Shetland like as far as coming there and living there for the, like at the beginning? Oh, in the very beginning, it was really scary. I moved up in January. Um, which is not a good time to move house. I opened a new business, a cafe uh, in January, which is not a good time to open a new business in Shetland. Um, and I moved into a house that had no central heating by myself because my husband stayed down here in London. So it was daunting and very scary, actually. I was, I was young then, so I wouldn't be able to do the same thing now, I don't think. And I certainly wouldn't recommend it to everybody. Uh, but the community was so welcoming. As a gay man, I had always been open, but that hadn't always been easy, right. even in a place like London. I had never really felt like I belonged anywhere until I moved to Shetland when I did feel that I actually belonged in that community because I was giving back to the community as much as I was taking from it. Gradually over time, as I've got older and I've got, I guess, more experienced and I've broadened my horizons, Shetland has sometimes felt a little too small for me, a little bit too close for comfort. But I'm lucky that I've got London to come to and, and experience a bit of anonymity and freedom. But I've never lived anywhere as in one place for as long as I've lived in Shetland. And I would definitely say that although I'm not a Shetlander, Shetland really encouraged me and took me to its heart and enabled me to be the person that I am today, gave me the freedom to experiment, gave me the freedom to be who I am. And if anybody was judging what I did or had thoughts about the uh, correctness of what I was doing, it's been very gentle lessons. There haven't been very many horrible surprises. And it's so, so funny that you mentioned that because I was interviewing Hazel Tindall and mm -hmm. I told her that like my one dream is to come to Shetland, bring all the lays that I needed and have like people critique it. And she was like, well, if you think you're going to be walking on the street and people going to be like jumping on you and criticizing your work, <laughs> like very mistaken because like you have to beg for it, <laughs> for the input. Did you feel the same way that like, unless you ask, nobody was ever criticizing your work? Well, I'm a, I'm a businessman, so I understand the, the value of, a, of an exchange of value. And one way that you can understand a critique of your work is through that exchange of value. So when numbers of people start declining coming into the studio. I know there's there's a reason why that is, and I need to do something about that. 
Um, I used to do a lot of music up in Shetland and I really stopped when I, it was unviable for me to, to continue to do all the traveling that I was doing. I just couldn't make ends meet. But gradually times moved on and my kind of music, classical music, I trained in opera eventually, um, that kind of music fell out of favor and the audiences grew smaller and smaller and smaller. And I stopped actually performing in public to a large extent when I realized that actually it wasn't viable to do that anymore. So I still sing, I still practice regularly, obviously not during COVID because we weren't allowed to, but I still practice, but it was actually the audience decline that I realized times are changing. So I never felt that people were consciously avoiding me because they were upset with me or anything like that. Um, people have always been quite clear about buying something or not buying something. And we sell a lot of our cloth to Shetlanders, which means that people actually value it. And I think also people are very keen on culture and heritage as it pertains to identity. And what we're trying to do is actually bring back a, an almost dead industry. And it very much was part of an identity of Shetland. So people still alive today who remember the heyday of weaving in Shetland, which was the 1950s and 60s. Well, let's talk about business side a little bit. So you have a store where, um, online store, where people can buy like scarves or throws or like there, there's like a few items. I saw this beautiful scarf with pockets that looked so cozy. <laughs> um, how do you come up with like what you're gonna make out of the cloth? Oh, that's another really good question. Um, so I don't live obviously anymore in Shetland, as I said, okay. all of those kinds of products I have handed over to the weaver and the person who actually makes those products up for us. And they come up with the ideas themselves. I will send them some ideas and say, what about this? Or have you tried this? Uh, and they come up with, with those product ideas. But I think it's, we only do limited editions of cloth because there's so much manual labor in what we do in order to, weave on our loom we have to hand warp we have to put all the threads onto the back beam of loom by hand and that takes six to eight hours to do and then we have to thread all the threads through by hand through the shafts what you might know as the harnesses and then tie it on the front and then we sample on the first part so it takes a few days to set up the loom for each run of cloth and then it takes a long time to actually weave it because we have to hand wind the spindles that we use for putting the wefts through. We have to constantly check for mistakes and make sure that everything's correct. So by the time we finish, we're probably only able to make five cloths a year of 30 meters finished cloth each, which is not a lot of cloth. Okay. People buy the cloth for themselves to make something out of, but what we found was that people loved the cloth, but they also didn't really know what they wanted to do with it. So we started experimenting with different kinds of things, scarves, obviously, because that's what lots of people want to make. Quickly realized that Shetland scarves are not as soft, of course, as something like alpaca or in any of those finer fibers. And that although we could sell them and people would enjoy wearing them, they weren't going to get as much wear as if we were to make something for outerwear. And that's where the idea of the shawl came from and the wraps, the cloaks, the things that we do. And then we sell on Instagram and Facebook. We, we don't sell through our website. And generally speaking, people on Instagram will send an email saying, I love that fabric. Please reserve me a throw or a wrap or something like that. So we know what we're making for them. Right. And do you have like your customers, are they coming from all over the world? Do you ship like everywhere? Yes. Yes, we've shipped to ooh, a lot of different places, New Zealand, Australia, um, South Africa, even uh, Israel, we've shipped, we haven't shipped very much direct to Asia, but we have a lot of visitors or have had before COVID a lot of visitors to the studio. 
and Japan, China, India, and those people were starting to come into the, the studio and buy from us. A lot to the UK and a lot to Europe. So when people come to Shetland, like let's say now that COVID is hopefully on the outside, you're going away, yeah, I'm, like we all have enough of it. <laughs> We're all so over it, aren't we? Right. <laughs> We're here already. <laughs> um, when people come to your studio, what can they expect to see? Well, at the moment, not very much because we're not open yet. Um, my staff and my volunteers are shielding, so we've kept the studios closed. But typically when people came before, um, there was a one-way system already in place. So we had two sides to the building, an education side, and then a small hallway, and then the production side. And people would come in at the education side and then walk their way through to the production end. The education end has big looms in it, it has hand looms, it has a lot of art on the walls, um, all sorts of different art, textile art, um, paper-based art, all sorts of different things that are interesting, uh, plus a lot of craft. So things like, um, at the moment we have a celebration vest for a boy with lots of amulets, silver amulets and strings on it uh, for good luck. Um, they, we had a rotating exhibition as well, so people might see kimonos, for example. Uh, we had a, a wedding dress, a wedding kimono hanging up for a long time. They would also see a library, a, a book library, and we had two different parts to that library. One was specifically for weaving, the other one was for world cultures and weaving around the globe. And then in the room next door, um, which is, part of the same studio, we had a small shop and that's where we would have all of our sort of display areas that people could buy on the internet, um, just so that people could see what we were doing. If you went through into the production end, again, we had a small seating area with lots of art on the walls for inspiration, and then the big production loom. And the big production loom is right in the corner of one of the, uh, sorry, right in the corner of the room. It's, when I say big, it's bigger than you would have in a normal house. But Shetland Tweed was always a cottage industry. So what basically we've done is gone back to its cottage industry roots and installed a loom in a domestic setting, at the sitting room and art on the walls and then this loom. I think what people find really interesting is the variety of art. So we have some very good textile pieces from very well-known artists. But we also have pieces that someone's made for a hobby. One of the pieces that gives a lot of comment is a, a brown um, needlework, woolwork piece, which has on it an antique car, a cricket bat, mathematical symbols and music. So it was obviously made for someone who had an interest, a very specific interest in those four things, but who that person was, we have no idea. <laughs> Um, what's the most unusual item somebody wanted you to make out of your cloth? Ooh. Oh, um, we had for a while a client in Canada who was very excited by our cloth and bought a lot of it. And she was very keen to have us make blazers, you know, jackets for, um, for her school because she felt that Shetland Tweed in Canada would be a really good, they, they live right up in the north somewhere in sort of above the snow line kind of thing. So that was quite unusual. Uh, another one was we had, again, someone from Canada who was a felt maker, is a felt maker, and she wanted us to make tweed that she could then felt. And we started that process and then COVID hit. So we, did, we didn't finish it. I think sculpture is probably the most out there thing. Oh, we have been asked actually to, to weave um, woolen bases for trees to stop weeds coming through, but that's just a waste <laughs> of wool. Actually, <laughs> there, there, there's other wool you can use for that, not Shetland wool. <laughs> right, right. What will you miss the most about living in Shetland? Oh, that's a very hard question. Um, space, peace, quiet, beauty, definitely beauty. 
I grew up in a landlocked country and I never realized how much the sea meant to me until I moved to Shetland and then moved away from Shetland. I will definitely miss the sea, definitely. Um, the people, quiet, generally speaking, were um, soft-spoken people, supportive, enthusiastic, friendly, just nice people. Uh, and there are nice people all over the place, but I think Shetlanders are a particular kind of people. The culture brings out a particular aspect of their personality. If you live in a hard climate, so I've heard, then you become softer because you, you kind of know your place in amongst the, the weather and the climate and the, um, the surroundings and all the rest of it. And up in Shetland, we live very close to nature. So my view from my house looks out over the, the sound onto the other islands. And if there's a storm, you know about it. There's, you know, there's huge waves crashing. The whole house, which was built in 1824 and has massive stone walls, the whole house shakes if there's a really, really big storm, which mercifully only happens once in a while. So I think I'll miss the drama of the weather and the scenery as well. What are you most excited about living in New Zealand? Like what are your expectations of New Zealand and what can she wait to experience there? You know, it, that, I'm very keen on nature, as you can tell, so I'm really keen to experience nature, but I think more than that, I'm keen to find out what kind of person I'm going to be when I'm there, because as an artist, I, as a performing artist, I found myself becoming a different person every time I've moved somewhere else. So, for example, in Zimbabwe, I was a different person to the person that actually ended up in London. And when I come to London, I'm a different person to the person up in Shetland. If I'm in Shetland, I'm very, I'm surrounded by nature and wildlife and birds and things like that. And I go for long walks by myself. In London, I'm excited about museums and galleries and, and the culture. I think what is really interesting for me though, and has been an abiding interest for a very long time, has been how cultures, mixed together to make something new. So in places like Zimbabwe or South Africa, across Africa, cloth, which we consider typically African, actually comes from Europe. It's designed in maybe Germany or, or the Netherlands or England. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, the designs are either sent over there to be made or the cloth is exported. There are, of course, lots of African cloths indigo cloth up in Nigeria or places like that, but how the different cultures have mixed together to make something new is really interesting and I'm interested too in the way that artists can play a role in helping that intermixing happen in a nice kind of way. There's a an artist I've recently found who works with traditional um, pattern uh, European clothing from the 17th and 18th century and she recreates those clothes but with traditional patterns on them uh, in traditional colors and that is a beautiful project and one that I really really like. Do you have like specific interest in historical costume as well? I've always liked dressing. I've always liked dressing up and showing off, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I've always collected. I used to make my own costume for stage. I've always collected textiles. So we have a big textile collection. And costume is very definitely part of it. A recent project I found out about was um, someone who'd woven some costume, uh, some cloth for costume for stage and hadn't finished the cloth, which means it hadn't been washed and pressed. And if you don't finish cloth, then as you wear it, it disintegrates, it falls apart because it's actually the washing of woolen cloth that, that makes it felt together slightly, firm together is a better word, firm together, and that shrinks it slightly, makes it firm. So if you don't wash it, it would disintegrate. So a costume that is actually designed to disintegrate as you perform a really dramatic play <laughs> with lots of death and dying in it, it's fascinating. So we do have a couple of pieces of, of costume, yeah. So when your company finishes the cloth, you don't press it and wash it, you send it away, right? 
if we do a long length for an order, it gets sent away to the finishes. Uh, uh, Shetland hasn't finished cloth in that way for a very long time in the old, old days. So we're talking sort of Viking times. Um, the cloth would be finished by putting it into a tuvikoli, which is a cleft in the rocks where the sea would come in and it would roll the cloth around. Oh, that's and so would, fascinating. Felt it. And it, the salt water would take the oils out. You'd have to wait, obviously, wait your fabric down. Okay. Um, and then finishing itself, commercial finishing for tweed was always done down south. I, I can't think of anyone up in Shetland that actually finished cloth. We do finish our cloth ourselves because we make short runs of cloth. So we would make maybe five meters for a couple of throws or a couple of wraps or something like that. Mm -hmm. Cut it off the warp, retention the warp ready for the next lot of weaving. And then we have a, a machine, a washing machine, and we use a local produced soap, which is specially designed for wool. And we then steam press it once it's been dried. And what, who's, what that does, who's sewing sorry. the final items, like if, for the store, like who, who does the sewing of like scarves and throws and all of that? We have a couple of volunteers that do that and then Alexa will do that too. So I saw like one of your cloth was this gorgeous like blues and greens and uh, like creams sort of thing, like is, do you always draw your inspiration from the nature around you when you come to those colors, like when you pick the colors? Yes, we do. Um, interestingly, it started off with photographs, looking at photographs, or actually the studios, the production end of the studios has, in the one corner, there's a window here and a window here, and the loom is at the other end of the room. So when you look out, you're looking out of a window and then out of a window, and you've got the most amazing views across the sound and you can watch the snowstorms coming in or the rain coming in and actually see the weather changing in front of you and the seasons of course changing right because you have but, different cloth for different seasons also yeah we've tended to have cloths seasonal cloths but they're not based on the season they're based on a specific location okay so we we used to take photographs of those specific locations and then make a cloth but Shetland is so photogenic that just about any location, you can see lots of color. If you look really closely in the summer, for example, you can see tiny flowers and lots and lots of tiny flowers, orchids and all sorts of things. In the winter, we've got obviously a little bit of snow if it's happened to snow, which sadly it doesn't do that much. Um, but when it does, it's very dramatic. Uh, we have red grass this time of year coming into September, which is a, a short what, eight inch grass, um, which goes crimson and, and a few seasons back in the setting sun, it looked like the hillsides were on fire. We have heather, all of, so the seasons do definitely play a role in the changing colors, but it's actually the location that we're interested in. The last few cloths that Alexa's made have actually been based on a painting. So, I was frustrated by the fact that I could see lots of color in the landscape, but couldn't capture it in a photograph without getting really close. So I started painting and my paintings are not professional by any means, of course, but they, they give a view of what I see in the landscape. And Alex has been using a color of a way, a painting of a wave, which has lots of color in it to make the last few plots and selecting different parts of the wave to, to explore and, and figure out um, what works together. Right. So yes, always scenery, surroundings, skyscapes, um, landscapes, seascapes. Yeah, inspiration so you're, definitely. You are a musician, you are a painter, you are a handicraftman. Um, do you cook as well? Do you find your inspirations for like food from different continents? <laughs> Yes, I trained in hotel and catering management and part of that was chefing. So it, it sounds as though I can't actually figure out who I want to be. No, I um, think it's I, all I, parts of you actually like find that, yeah. yeah. The melting so pot. I'm, absolutely. I'm one of these people who gets bored quite quickly if I'm, if I'm doing something um, not, not very interesting. I like to have lots of variety which is strange to be a weaver because weaving is very methodical and it's slow and it's logical, but I never ever get bored with 
with that process because I know at the end of the process there's going to be something lovely to look at and something I can be proud of. I think it's I think it's really interesting to explore all these different things. And I think, as I said, you know, I'm going to be a different person in New Zealand. So when I moved to Shetland, it was specifically to teach music. And then I got involved with textiles okay. and textiles gradually took over. And I'm sure when I go back to when I go to New Zealand, I'll do something different. I'm excited by the fact that I could return to music or I could be something completely different. Do you have any like hobbies or some interests that you like sort of consider but never really done but like entertaining the idea that you might get to that? Oh, lots. <laughs> I would have loved to have been an explorer and found lots of new parts of the world. I would have loved to study geology. Um, I would have been very happy to be a historian. Um, Nature is definitely a hobby of mine. I mean, that, that influences my work. Um, but looking at nature, encouraging nature, I do gardening, um, both here and in Shetland, and encouraging nature is definitely something I'm interested in. New Zealand's um, wildlife and uh, plant life is so different that I'm looking forward to seeing if I can actually grow a gardener that I could recognize and that will be interesting. I would love to be a really good artist, visual artist. I'm not sure that's ever going to happen, but I'll have fun trying. And I also would have loved to have been an animator. I think animation is a, an amazing skill and I can't do any of that. Well, I, honestly, I can't wait to see what New Zealand Andy is going to be like and look like and I'll, <laughs> I'll keep an eye on you and see what else you're going to come up with. <laughs> Fantastic, I look forward to it. <laughs> and thank you so much for being my guest today. I really enjoyed our chat. And I'm glad thank, I got to you, get Rina. to know you. <laughs> yes, it's been lovely to get to know you too. And if you do happen to find yourself in Shetland, I will be back periodically. Um, drop me a line and let me know and we can meet up in Shetland and have a good old natter. That sounds really wonderful. Thank you. Okay.